And quite often people at this stage also start reporting that they can't keep up anymore. They're not effective enough anymore. And in order to overcome this not being effective enough, they quite often try to put even more work in. In today's video, I'll be talking with Cornelia Kastner, a clinical and organizational psychologist specializing in work-related stress, organizational culture and employee engagement. She's also trained in positive psychology coaching and works as an adjunct professor at Vienna Webster Private University and as a lecturer at Sigmund Freud University in Vienna. In this video, we'll talk with Cornelia about burnout, what it actually is and why it's important to keep your relationship with work in check. Jumping in, we're here to talk about burnout. And to me, it's a very, very fascinating topic. And first question to, to ask would be, what is burnout really? Because I feel like burnout at this point is one of the things similar to depression that people use in their everyday language. And they're like, oh, I'm feeling so depressed. I'm feeling so burned out from work. But actually, there's a lot more psychological meaning behind it that people don't really realize that, that there is. So from your professional expert opinion as a, as a psychologist, what is burnout actually? I would say that's a question that's still being debated. Mm. So the, the topic of burnout is a also, in my opinion, a really interesting one, because as you said, um, there is this common use of the word and we use it for, for example, for being stressed. So a lot of people would say, oh, I almost have a burnout, just as their common language of, oh my God, I feel really stressed at the moment. And the interesting thing is that up to today, burnout itself is not yet classed as a mental disorder, which adds to that slight blur between common language and professional language. Overall, what we, what, for example, the World Health Organization would agree on is burnout is a syndrome that results from a lot of chronic stress in the workplace. So it's normally occupational, has an occupational focus. And the amount of chronic stress in the workplace is so heavy or there's so much of it that we are not able to cope properly. So there's two elements that I find important to point out. On the one hand side, the fact that we're talking, yes, about stress, but not just about stress for one day, because I think all of us know that sometimes, yes, we do have stress, it's normal. But we are talking about chronic stress. And this chronic stress has to amount to an extent that our systems are unable to cope with. And unable to cope with now is again a bit blurry and, and I'm aware of that, but I assume we'll, we'll talk about symptoms later on. And this is how we can understand unable to cope with. So we can't function as well as we did before that amount of chronic stress. That would mean that our bodies, our minds are not able to cope with that level of stress anymore. From what you're saying, it's connected to being under stress for a longer period of time and somehow not being able to cope anymore. You mentioned that it's connected to work, but there's a lot of different things that can stress us out in life. So if, for example, someone is at home with, uh, with their children and they're not really having you know, professional challenges, uh, would this also be something that could result in a burnout? The World Health Organization generally defines burnout in an occupational context. However, um, from a psychological point of view, work does not necessarily have to be paid work. Mm -hmm. And I think anyone who's ever looked after children or ever done household chores knows that, yes, that's definitely also work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So while it might not be paid work, being at home, looking after children, caring for elderly relatives, all of this is also work. And therefore, my personal slash professional opinion would be yes, of course. So if we have multiple um, demands or too many demands, also in our private lives, that still equate to some kind of work. And to be honest, quite often from my experience, it's also the case that even if the burnout is somehow rooted in professional work, paid work, there's often still private factors that contribute. So we can't really look at the one side without looking at the other side. If we're stressed at work, we're normally also stressed at home. If we're stressed at home, quite often that stress carries over to work as well. So of course, they interlink. And in that case, looking at burnout, what would actually be the symptoms that would be considered as a burnout? 
So there are individual differences. I think one of the main symptoms that we always see with burnout, and that's also kind of at the center of our definition of our definition when we look at clients, for example, is exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So burnout means I'm absolutely exhausted. I can't keep up my energy anymore. I can't deal with my work or private demands anymore. Quite often, there's also accompanying physical symptoms. So for example, I struggle to sleep, insomnia, um, why? Because my thoughts might be racing, for example. Um, quite often there's symptoms with my appetite. This is also classic stress symptoms. So either I might binge eat because I'm so stressed or my appetite might just disappear. I might have huge cravings for unhealthy food and not eat anything healthy anymore. I think most people would know that. So all of these are stress symptoms that we can also observe in burnout already. One other one that I see quite often with clients who are already quite under a lot of chronic stress is nervous twitches. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but for me, I have actually, that the eyelid starts twitching and you can't control it. And you're wondering if you've just been staring at a screen for too long. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Or, or we get muscle tensions. I don't know, the, the neck muscles tense up, the jaw muscles tense up. Mm -hmm. So all of these are physical symptoms. And with regards to psychological symptoms, something else that we often see with burnout is slight depressive tendencies. So there is quite an overlap between depression and burnout. Just that the, with burnout, the exhaustion is more in the focus still. But still, people who suffer from a severe burnout may also experience severe depressive symptoms where they don't see a way out of work anymore, where the days feel kind of gray, where they have low moods. So a lot of those symptoms we also find after a burnout. So we have kind of these these three groups, categories that we have. First of all, the exhaustion, which I suppose is both physical and uh, and mental. Then we have the, the group of the physical symptoms and uh, and at the end, the, the psychological ones. If, yeah, if or a, more emotional ones. Emotional, yes. And if a person is getting diagnosed, which boxes would they have to take in each of these categories for um, a psychologist to be able to say, you have burnout? Unfortunately, because there's not the one clear classification, the tick, tick box system is actually a bit difficult for burnout. So what I normally do when I try to diagnose clients, when I try to see where they're coming from, is to also look at the progression of where it comes from. So um, of course, I would A, C, is the exhaustion symptom there? So do people report that they feel a lack of energy? Do they report that they feel absolutely depleted? I can't work up the energy to cope with my day-to-day -day tasks anymore. I just want to stay in bed. That's one thing I would look at. The second thing I would look at is where, how did it start? So quite often we see a progression in burnout that interestingly enough, and I think that's something you had in your last interview already, where the colleague said something about sometimes, you know, more and more of the work because you love it so much can actually be a warning sign. Mm -hmm. And I found it really interesting because it links so strongly to burnout because we often observe that the first stage of burnout is actually increased satisfaction. So people start off being really happy at work and they really want to excel at work. So they have this idealistic excitement about work. And because of that, they start pouring more and more of themselves into work. And as I said, work does not necessarily have to be paid work. But because of that pouring more and more of themselves into it, they have a lack of recovery. So they just can't really fully recharge their batteries anymore. And quite often, this is when chronic symptoms start. And it's really interesting because in a diagnostic process, we hear those steps very clearly and very often. And chronic symptoms are the ones that I already mentioned. So we start seeing physical symptoms at this stage. People start reporting that they don't sleep so well. They might also start saying, oh, yeah, for example, with psychologists, what we quite often hear is that rather than calling the clients by their, by their names or talking about them as human beings, they might say, think, oh yeah, the depression in room three. So <laughs> rather than talking about people, they talk about diagnosis because they try to distance themselves from work. Mm -hmm. And quite often people at this stage also start reporting that they can't keep up anymore. They're not effective enough anymore. And in order to overcome this not being effective enough, they quite often try to put even more work in, mm. which of course leads to a bit of a vicious cycle because now they're pouring even more energy in and getting less out of it because, well, the body and the mind just can't keep up anymore. Mm. And this quite often leads to a crisis. So crisis means 
people realize now, okay, I'm putting so much effort in and still I can't keep up with my work. And unfortunately, quite often, this is the step where people come to see me, come to speak to me. Why am I saying unfortunately? Because one step earlier, so when they first notice the first symptoms, intervention would be a lot quicker. However, that's quite often the stage that people miss. They come when there's the full crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's not a problem. Better then than even later. And of course, we can still intervene. Just even a step earlier would be even quicker. And so this is the crisis that I normally see, which if there was no intervention there, then quite often the overwhelm could lead to a breakdown. And breakdown might then actually be a complete depression, might lead into aggressive behaviors. And those would be all the tendencies that I would try to spot in a diagnostic process so that I would look out for. Are there concrete symptoms? What's the progression? The symptoms in those three classes that we already discussed. How do people talk about their work? And that way I can normally quite nicely pinpoint not only is there a tendency towards a burnout, but also which stage might people be at. It's very interesting how, how the vicious cycle works that actually, because of so much work and so much prolonged stress, you're not performing anymore, but then actually that stresses you even more because you're not really used to underperforming and then you put even more pressure uh, on yourself and uh, in the end, it, it doesn't help uh, at all. You mentioned uh, different stages of, of burnout. What are the different stages? Usually, and this is a prototypical um, explanation of the stages, but usually, as I said, the first stage would be this increased satisfaction. So I'm actually really happy at work. I enjoy it. I pull myself into it. This is actually not surprising, or in, in this context, it's not surprising that burnout was first identified historically with healthcare workers or helping professions. Because these are normally the type of professions where people, that people go into because they want to help, because they're idealistic. So first stage, increased satisfaction. And then the second stage is normally this lack of recovery. So I don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy to recover anymore. Then the third stage is normally the chronic symptoms that set in. So we are now in a chronic level of stress, which also means that I'm starting to notice changes. The fourth stage would be the crisis. So I now notice I can't keep up anymore and I really don't know how to deal. So that's a clear and significant event normally. And then the last stage would be overwhelm and breakdown. Mm -hmm. So where really nothing works anymore. How do people get from something like the, you know, the completely last stage, the, the breakdown? I suppose it takes more time and uh, an effort than just spotting it kind of in the earlier stages. But what would be the, the treatment for, for the last stage, for example? First of all, yes, I agree. It would take longer than from the previous stages. Um, and quite often, if people are already in the very last stage where we're at treatment, they also need a change in their professional lives or wherever the, the root of the problem lies. So sometimes this might be connected to actually sick leave. Sometimes it might be connected to just a holiday. That depends on how severe the burnout is. And the treatment can be quite individual mm -hmm. because as I said before, it's yes, of course, professional life here, but there's also personality factors that influence burnout. There's relationships that influence burnout. And to a certain degree, the societal um, circumstances influence burnout as well. And of course, well, all of this can have negative consequences. It also means we have a lot of different options for treatment, which is the nice thing. There's, there's not necessarily the one best way, but we can treat burnout in a very individual manner, mm -hmm. which for me as a psychologist means my first step is to find out what are the main pain points that the client has. Where did it start? What really started off this burnout? And one example that I quite often see is that sometimes clients tend to um, have a very stressful and intense job, which they really enjoy. And then they seek more of the same in their private life, be it by chance or be it on purpose. So classic case would be someone who's already in a helping profession and then volunteers in a helping profession. And that obviously intensifies the cycle of not being able to recover because I'm doing more of the same in my leisure time. Mm -hmm. So this would be one example. And in this case, I'd say, okay, our treatment needs to start with changing those circumstances. Yeah. In other cases, it might be that a client says, to be honest, it all started when I started feeling very perfectionist. 
So this is a bit more of an internal course. So in this case, we look at when did it start? When did you start feeling like you wanted to do everything perfect? And how can we change the thought pattern? So in this case, we try to change the internal factors. And quite often it's a combination. Is there any technique that you see kind of as being very regular and, uh, and usual with, uh, with a lot of different clients that this is kind of one thing that, that works well? I still wouldn't want to say it works for all because otherwise I also feel like I'm saying anyone who can't handle their stress with this technique um, is doing something wrong. And I don't want to say that because sometimes it's just other, other aspects as well. But one aspect that I observe very frequently or one thing that can help a lot is setting boundaries. So one thing that I really like to work on with my clients is how to set boundaries. And I know for a lot of people, it's difficult because yeah, you might read, oh, just start saying no. Well, if it was that easy, I would already be doing it. So one thing, for example, that I'd like to, to work on with my clients is rather than saying no to everything, just start saying yes, but or no, but. So a bit of a softer way of boundaries. So rather than saying, um, I don't know, if my colleague asks me, hey, can you take my shift tonight? Rather than saying no, I'll say, yes, I can, but only if you take my shift tomorrow because I need time for recovery. Or I say, no, I cannot, but I think I heard that Mr. X has a bit of free time and maybe he wants to take over. So rather than having that feeling of I leave my colleagues or whoever hanging, I can offer an alternative, but still I don't take it on unconditionally. That's why those yes buts and no buts can help, for example. Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to work that you're passionate about, it's, it's so easy to just say yes to everything. And having the, the no in your pocket as something to use is definitely a very, very useful trick. If I'm passionate about it, I sometimes don't want to say no. But sometimes I also need to f get this feeling that if I don't say no now, I might have to say no even more later because I'm on this way into burnout. So it might be better to start saying no or yes, but or no, but a bit earlier because I might actually be helping out a lot more later on when I'm still healthy myself. So I do need to care about myself early on in order to prevent a full burnout later on. So we spoke about the full burnout and what the treatment could be uh, in a case that a person goes through something like that. We do have different stages of it though, as, as we mentioned. What could people observe in themselves? What is the point where they should say, maybe I need, I need some help because I imagine a lot of us feel, you know, have some tension sometimes, or we feel uh, tired for different reasons, but it might not necessarily be an issue of, of a burnout or, or even on that path. So when, when would be the time when a person should see someone about that? I think there's maybe two steps to it. So um, I would always suggest, ideally the latest point to see help is when you really notice the actual symptoms in yourself. So for example, I'm starting to have this nervous eye twitching and it's not going away anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is also when, if you think about a physical illness, um, if you've had a stomach ache for seven days, you'd most likely start going to see a doctor. Similar with burnout. If I notice that actually I've had problems sleeping for a week or two, I might want to just see someone who can give me an outside view. Is this still healthy or not? Mm -hmm. Because quite often self-awareness might get a bit clouded when I'm really engaged in work. Yeah. Um, so latest when I observe those symptoms, I would suggest go see someone and if they tell you, hey, that's completely normal, even better. The step even earlier that I always recommend to my clients to start observing is to see if work engages you because it draws you in. So is it exciting? Or because you feel like you need to push through it. Mm. And that's two slightly different aspects. So if I'm really excited about um, a project I'm working on and I feel drawn in by it, it's this feeling of, oh, I want to see where it goes. Whereas if I feel like, oh, I just need to get through this one more week, that can also be engagement because I see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I have to push. And in my stomach, that's normally a very different feeling. My gut feeling is different about that. Mm -hmm. It's either, wow, excitement, butterflies almost, or it's a, oof, that hurts. That's really exhausting. When it's this feeling of, I just need to push through and just one more week and maybe one week after that and one more week after that one, that's an early warning sign for me because that shows that yes, there is something that's, the conditions aren't 
healthy for me because otherwise I wouldn't have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. I might not necessarily need to go see someone exactly at that point yet, but my alarm bell should ring. So either I need to start setting boundaries, changing the circumstances. And if I feel like that's too difficult for me, then it might be worth going to see someone just for that outside perspective, just for that little bit of a boost for support. So firstly, doing kind of a check-in with yourself of where am I and how, how am I feeling or has this been going on for a longer period of time? And then, yeah, when in doubt, go go see a specialist because there's there's plenty of people who, who are actually they specialize in professionals in this area and, and they can be of great help and in the end save us a lot of trouble. Definitely, especially because really prevention of burnout is so much quicker than treatment of burnout normally. Mm -hmm. So if we catch it early, we can quite often very quickly change the circumstances and get people back up and running in a healthier manner mm -hmm. rather than treating it afterwards. Yeah. What would be considered uh, as a prevention of burnout? Something that people can do themselves already is if you notice you're in the stage of, oh, it might be getting a bit too much. As I said, first of all, setting boundaries early, mm -hmm. but maybe also thinking about your leisure. How do I, how do I create my free time? As I said before, is it more of the same? For example, if I'm an accountant, am I actually doing my friend's bookkeeping in my free time because they asked me to? Or am I doing something that really recharges my batteries? What type of leisure activities do recharge my batteries? Sometimes we don't even know that. We need to start exploring those options. To be honest, prevention can also be, I don't know, physical contact with the partner, actually hugging someone and taking the time to hug someone. If you, if you even think about hugging one's own children, all of that can give energy back. Spending quality time with friends, having a good heartfelt laugh and taking the time for that. All of that is prevention, self-care. And obviously on a bigger level, if you work with someone on the outside, you can also look at how can I change the circumstances at work? For example, is it too much workload? Do I need to reduce workload? Or is it, do I have enough control over how I work? Mm -hmm. Does my work fit with my values? Can I change something there in order to make it fit better? All of these things are aspects that we know influence burnout, influence stress, and that we can do little tweaks on beforehand to prevent it getting that bad. And I love that actually from this, we can summarize a list of questions that, that the people could ask themselves and, uh, and do this kind of self-awareness exercise uh, to, to see how they're doing. And, and then from there decide if, if more help is needed or, or they're okay the way they are. Absolutely. I think it's probably quite difficult to find an extensive list, but um, there's definitely a few questions that are easy to summarize. What resonated the most with me would be to, first of all, look at the prevention mm -hmm. and uh, set boundaries when they're necessary. So, so to be able to have healthy boundaries, such as saying yes or no, and uh, also being aware of what recharges you. So if work is not the thing that recharges you, then, then have kind of different outlets of what, what could recharge you. And, and lastly, and I think this is so important and so uh, underrated oftentimes is when, when in doubt, really go, go see a specialist. There's, there's no, no shame in asking for help. And this is the thing that when we're feeling not so good physically wise, we go see a doctor and that's, that's a very normal thing, but people don't always talk about, I need to go see a psychologist or a life coach or whatever uh, kind of fits, fits best for you. One last question, if people want to learn more about burnout, what resources could they go see? Generally, I have a bit of a summary of resources on my website. So people could refer to my website just to find a summary of resources as well. Um, one of the leading experts in burnout research as well is Christina Masler. And she also publishes a lot of her work for free. So if someone wants to have a real look at the science behind burnout, I would recommend to look at her works just because she's uh, been there pretty much from the beginning of burnout and still updates her research. So that's definitely a great scientific resource. 
as I mentioned before, when in doubt, go consult a specialist. And actually, we have one specialist right over here. Um, and because you focus also on burnout and occupational psychology. So if you guys are interested, I'll be including Cornelia's website uh, link in the description below. And uh, if you feel like you, you need some support in this area, you can reach out to her. Um, she does a 30 minute free introduction session. So yeah, you can definitely go check that out. Thank you very much for, for your time and for, for doing the interview. Thank you for having me and also for bringing this really important topic more attention because I think burnout, well, yes, it's, it's kind of a modern topic and it is in a lot of media. I think it's hugely important to also look at it from a slightly more scientific side. So thanks for that. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to Iconic for more content around psychology and personal development. See you in the next video.